welcome everyone to Zen and the Art of Zendesk Configuration. Um, we're going to be talking today about how to kind of level up your Zendesk administration game. Um, my name is Scott Dixon. I am a customer engineer here at Salto. I help mm -hmm. our customers onboard and implement with uh, Salto to kind of make sense of their Zendesk configuration and to get a full change management process in place. And Craig. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Stoss. I am a uh, CX consultant and and mainly in the tool space. I spend a lot of time uh, working with the different tool sets across the the CX tech stack, help desks, help centers, uh, chatbots, AI, that type of stuff. And uh, and most recently was building a uh, Zendesk administration and fractional implementation team uh, at a at a at a BPO outsourcer. And so spending a lot of time. Um, making sure that the best practices of Zendesk were being uh, maintained. Awesome. So thanks for being here, Craig. And today we're going to be talking about uh, a couple challenges that Zendesk administrators face. And uh, Craig, you're going to be sharing some kind of stories from the, the field, some uh, some horror stories, in fact, of uh, some, some issues you've ran across, some, some challenges you've seen with uh, clients in your own experience. And then I'm going to share a little bit about how Salto can help you um, uh, work past those challenges. Uh, just a little, just a few pieces of housekeeping. As I mentioned before, there is a chat, so please feel free to drop in any comments, questions you might have throughout the webinar. There is also a specific Q and A section, so if you want to drop a specific question, we'll make sure to either answer that live, um, or we might have to get back to you depending on on the question. And then at the at the end, we will uh, send you out an email, probably likely tomorrow, with a recording of the uh, of the webinar. So let's get started with the first challenge. So one of the first challenges we see is uh, the alignment of sandbox and production. So getting those aligned so you can actually leverage your sandbox environment. Can it be done? So Craig, what are some of the the challenges that you've seen with with getting those those environments aligned, mm -hmm. and what does it yeah. cause? Yeah, I mean, it's this is a this is a story that resonates with me so so much. Back in one of my very first uh, jobs, I worked in a in an industry where um, where the software was highly configurable, and and we didn't have any way of storing these, backing these things up, and and so uh, me and a couple of coworkers actually grassroots a program to to make sure that we could uh, back up these things and migrate them through a proper dev test prod type type change management model. And, and so, but the, the two things that we see specific to Zendesk um, is, is that there's no real migration concept. You can, you can sync your sandboxes at, at a point in time um, and then do some, uh, do some work in one and, and then do that same work again. But it, keeping that synchronization is, is very difficult. Um, and so that's a big one. No, 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 no migration. And then the second one, and I think this is the one that's most common, or at least the ones I observe in, in my experience, is the sandbox becomes a test bed. And people go in there and like, well, I wonder if this works. Or I wonder if I can try this thing. Or um, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to make this trigger happen that's kind of complex. And so I'll put in a bunch of different rules and delete stuff and play with it. And there's no way of knowing what has been or has not been migrated. But I think what's what's even worse is that um, by doing the testing in the sandbox, you've actually made it a less reliable test bed because you're you're putting in changes that may or may not be migrated. You're putting in different combinations of things. Maybe you're creating two or three triggers to, to test you know three things at once. Now all of a sudden, any future tests are now corrupted because of because of the very nature of. Uh, uh, of that ironic, you know, you're using it as a test bed and it's an, an unreliable test bed to begin with. So mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I, I imagine a world where, uh, again, going back to my, my previous example, where uh, you have a dev test prod, where these things were, were mandatory to be synced. And in order for something to move to prod had to be dev, dev was your test bed. Test bed was the, okay, this is ready for production. Let's make sure it works. And then over to production. And, uh, and, and so I think, um, you know that's the ideal solution here and the best practice. And and I know Scott and I know you'll touch on this is how does Salto fit into that, right? And and how can they how can they help that that best practice? So, so uh, funny funny ask that Craig. We also got a question here uh, from Brock saying that 
you know, new to change management at, at a decision maker role, how do you leverage Salta to do a good job in this role? So um, that's a great question, Brock. So let me walk you through um, how you could kind of work through this uh, alignment problem that you can have with not having sandbox and production uh, aligned. Now, while I do that, I'm going to open up a poll and I've got, I'd like to ask the audience a little bit about, you know, how you're leveraging a sandbox today in, in Zendesk, if you are. So I'm going to launch that poll shortly. So feel free to drop your answers in uh, and we will reveal the results at the end of the call. All right, so let me jump right into Salto and talk a little bit about how Salto can help you keep those environments aligned. And actually, Craig, um, you know, I got a quick question for you. So let's say that I only have a production environment and I'm making changes directly to production. What, what are the risks? What, what could go wrong there? <laughs> I I think the problem with Zendesk is that there's no um, everything's either live or not live, and so what what I find, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but what I find is that even a small change, especially in a in a uh, complex uh, Zendesk environment, like maybe multiple teams are using it, multiple brands are using it, um, or or you have multiple administrators. Uh, a small change, like uh, like adding a, a category to a field or subtracting a category from a field or a, you know, a field option, um, putting a, a line item in the any versus the all uh, setting of a trigger. Uh, these small changes can have large implications because uh, especially when you know one trigger maybe fires the next trigger, which not it fires the next trigger. And those things, if, if one trigger doesn't fire, then all sorts of unexpected behavior ha happens. And I think the real problem that that causes, yeah, not only is it disruptive to you know your support workflows, but then all of a sudden it becomes a troubleshooting exercise, and especially in a world with multiple admins where you don't know who changed it, why they changed it, is it working for them? And now you're going to break it if you undo it, if you find the the, the the problem, the root cause, and that is is detrimental to everyone because now you've you've broken something, then you fix it, and then something else breaks because they intended that change. Um, and, and you start ending up with this ping pong type type scenario where, where you gotta get together and to discuss who's making the change, why they're making the change, and uh, and what is the potential impact analysis of that change. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that context, Craig. So let me jump right into how Salto can kind of help you with that. Uh, with that initial problem? How do you keep those environments aligned so you can actually use your sandbox effectively? Um, so just as a as kind of a foundation for uh, for Salto, it's a, Salto is a configuration management platform for Zendesk as well as some other best business applications. And Salto will basically run a fetch to, to pull down all of the configuration metadata that makes up a Zendesk instance. That could be a sandbox instance or a production instance and allow you to first explore what's currently set up. So for example, I can take a look at all of the triggers that I've got set up in, in this case, in my sandbox environment. And if I click on a specific trigger, I can also see where that trigger, uh, all the dependencies of that trigger. In this case, I can see that it's relying on a group and a ticket field. I can click in on that ticket field and I can also see where that ticket field is being referenced. Very, very helpful uh, for impact analysis, understanding that if I were to make a change to this ticket field, you know, add an option, maybe change it from a multi-select to a single select, may change it to a checkbox, it could potentially impact these 17 other elements. In this case, we've got two automations, six macros, and, and so on. Now, once Salto has all of that configuration metadata that makes up the environment, we're able to then run deployments between environments. Now, the first step to running a deployment between any two environments in Salto is comparing those environments. So let me just show you what that is going to look like. So in compare and deploy, I'm going to select my source and my target environment. So in this case, I'm selecting my source environment as my sandbox and for my target environment, I am selecting my production. And I am going to call this, uh, let's see, update macro. Because ultimately what I'd like to do is take a change that I made to a macro in Sandbox and push that all the way up to production rather than having to configure that manually. So as soon as I create a, de a deployment in Salto, a comparison deployment in Salto, it's immediately going to show me a comparison 
of all the differences or the deltas between those two environments. So in this case, sandbox and production. Now, just to kind of break down what, what we're looking at here, it, the, what this screen is basically telling me that if I want to get production to mirror sandbox, so to get it to look exactly the same as sandbox, that will require 869 changes. Now, uh, just to let you know, these two instances, uh, I'm mostly using these for demo purposes. That's why we've got a, a, a lot of differences here. Um, so this would be a, a great place to kind of come in and really understand why do I have so many differences uh, between these environments. So in Salto, we are also going to split out those differences by additions, modifications, and deletions. Um, additions, you can think of them as basically, these are all the net new configurations. These are configurations such as triggers, automations, fields that are sitting there in sandbox that have not yet been added to, to production. Vice versa, deletions are all of the configurations that are in productions, maybe hot fixes, changes made directly in production that have not been moved to sandbox. So this is probably going to be one of the biggest sources of misalignment between the, the environments is elements that simply don't exist in one versus the other. Then in this middle tab, Salta is going to show you the modifications. In other words, configurations that exist in both but might have some sort of difference. Maybe you change the title, maybe you change the condition of a, of a trigger, um, but you can identify uh, the differences here. So let me show you an example of what a difference of a macro could look like. So I've got this dark mode macro that I've updated in Sandbox. Now I can see specifically, I've looks like I've added a ticket field and as well as a specific option as one of the actions uh, for this macro. Now, in case you're you're here in a comparison in Salto and you're trying to understand, you know, what I don't remember making that change or I don't really know exactly what that looks like in the Zendesk UI. Um, within Salto, you can always just go directly to that uh, that that element in the source or the target environments. But let's say that I want to go ahead and add this change to production. So I'm going to go ahead and select this. Now I've selected again, I've selected basically to add this action to add a ticket field and one of the, those options. As soon as I add that Salto, because it knows the dependencies and whether the dependencies exist in the target environment, it's going to flag that we've got a couple of required dependencies. In this case, a ticket field and a ticket field custom option. So I want to go ahead and add those for deployment. So this is really helpful because Salta is going to flag not only the change that you've made, but any related changes to make sure that you get everything together in one go uh, when you deploy into uh, production. Now, it's it's really common when you select maybe a more complex configuration like a trigger, you're probably going to have a chain of dependencies, but Salta is going to keep track of that. And as you add more and more elements to your deployment, you're going to be able to uh, you're going to be able to see those dependencies, add them to uh, the deployment. Now, if I were to move forward with this deployment, let me go ahead and actually do that. Um, it, Salto will first kind of validate that we can actually push these changes into production. And then ultimately you can use Salto to actually push that change into production. I noticed I got a couple of questions. Um, first question, while, while this is running, let me take a look at these. Uh, Doing doing some of these practices in my sandbox that Craig mentions, my first time taking a crack at it, so that's expected. How do I learn some of these best practices? So, Craig, question for you. Uh, Brock, Brock mentioned yeah. that uh, some of these kind of cowboy practices in sandbox. What are some kind of best practices to to avoid that? Oh, yeah. There's there's a lot of combinations there, Brock. I I um I think first and foremost. The the one thing that I find Zendesk is a is a is a complex web of of features, right? You know, the the fields, uh, the dependencies that were just shown by Scott is a good example of that. Um, one of the things that I I like to do is label everything very clearly. So the trigger name has meaning. It's not like testing, in, you know, refund workflow assignment. Like you know, it's 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 like this is the refund workflow assignment for this team. And then the description is it's used by this team for this purpose. Uh, it's intended to run in this use case, you know, very clear descriptions of why this trigger exists. And then when someone does go to make a change, they can look at that and be like, um, you know, if I change this, does that affect 
other teams because the teams are listed who uses it or the, the workflows are that are listed that, that uses that trigger. Um, and it could be, and it could say like, uh, will it impact, uh, will the change I'm making it stop that from working or will it add to it? And, and you can make a better decision. Now that still isn't perfect impact analysis, but at least helps you understand who, if you want to make a change, you know, you even have to talk to, to see if that changes is, is uh, will impact them. Um, another, another thing that I like to do, uh, is, uh, and this is a kind of a hidden feature is that triggers and uh, macros and, and automations have a, how much are they being used uh, 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 column in, in the in the admin UI that's that's sometimes not hit, uh, not there by default. You don't have it activated by default. I like having that open at all times because if I'm going to make a change with trigger and I see in the last seven days that trigger is fired 5,000 times, I'm pretty sure that's an important trigger. And I, you know, I think twice before I make an edit to that trigger versus something that maybe has run once or twice or never in the last seven days, you might be able to say, okay, well, that trigger, I could probably change a bit more safely or, or, uh, or maybe that triggers you completely, completely irrelevant and can be deleted altogether. So there's things like that, that, um, I would start there. Uh, better documentation and and you know visibility into what the what the use usage of that is. Those are those are two ideas that come off the top of my head. Great, thank thanks, Greg. All right, so it looks like in this case, I was able to kind of move forward to the next step. Um, basically, Salto is running some some kind of pre deployment validation, making sure that the changes can be uh, deployed into production. Now at this next step, I can go ahead and start to deploy these changes. So I'm going to go ahead and click deploy. And while the deployments are running, I've got a couple other questions. So I will take a look. And uh, one question, so Sandbox has become pretty unrelated to production once changes are getting more complex. How are you managing that? In other words, uh, it's, it's almost as if Sandbox has become so unaligned from prod that it's no longer useful. It might need kind of a, a fresh start. Craig, have you ever run into that situation where just you need to start over and, and what, what do you yep. do? Yeah, I mean, short answer is yes. I think that's actually uh, the number one problem with sandboxes um, is that over time they inherently will get out of sync, uh, especially if there's multiple administrators, especially as you know the more complex your teams are. Um, uh, I think it's plan-based, but if I recall correctly, Zendesk does have a, you know, quote unquote, start from scratch mode. I, I forget the name of the specific feature, um, but it will basically delete your existing sandbox and recreate it with, with a current copy of production. Of course, that's a bit disruptive. If you are testing something um, that you want to keep, there's no way to, to kind of pick and choose what you're, you're keeping. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would argue that if you get to a point, as I was suggesting in my, for my intro to the, the first question, um, if you get to a point where your tests become unreliable, you are better to start from scratch and rebuild some some new things than you are uh, to to try to undo things and and manually make it back in sync. Because I I don't think the complexity of of Zendesk um, is not so much in the the number of objects that can exist. Uh, it's it's more so in the fact that auditing in Zendesk is very hit and miss. So for example, triggers, I don't, I'm sure I'm going to screw this up because I don't have it in front of me, but trigger triggers will tell you when it was edited and who edited it last. And, and you can see some of the field changes that occurred uh, in the, in the rules. Uh, whereas that's not available for macros or, or that's not available for automations. And, and so the, the audit capabilities are so, uh, so inconsistent that it makes it really hard to revert something uh, especially if it's a, a bigger change. Like if you've added a complete new workflow, ripping that new workflow out is almost impossible. So yeah, use the refresh uh, capability uh, that Zendesk provides is, is the number one tip there. And I just had one, one thing to add to that, Craig, uh, when you are using the refresh capabilities um, in, in Zendesk, one really great thing to do before you do that is come into Salto, run a comparison, and take a look at that additions tab. This additions tab is basically everything in Sandbox that would be completely wiped out if you were to do a refresh. Um, you can come into Salto, 
And you can also export that as a CSV. So you get a full list of all those objects that essentially would be wiped out. Um, it can save you a lot of headache uh, uh, trying to avoid that in the, uh, in the future. Now, I got a couple other questions here in the q and I might actually, I'm, I'm gonna leave some of those, uh, kind of pepper them in as we go along, because I wanna go to our next topic, which is going to be all around kind of collaborating with the wider team. So, you know, the question, yeah. did someone touch my trigger? So Craig, can you uh, kind of share a little bit about the challenges <laughs> to having lots of different people in the same Zendesk org making changes? Yeah, I mean, if I had a nickel, for every time I've seen the Slack message, did someone make a change this morning? Um, you know, uh, I, I'd be a much wealthier, wealthier man. There, there is a even in the base case, you likely need one, two or three administrators. You know, just for the sake of sick leave, personal leave, things like that, right? Uh, so there's, there's, there isn't, there is always going to be a problem with multiple men's uh, in the system because they, by nature of most companies. You know, going back to maybe Brock's question about best practice, I, part of the cause of this is that I feel like we're too liberal with permission sets. We we basically have you're either an admin or you are an agent, and and that's there's that's even a reduction on what Zendesk provides you out of the box. They provide you like five different levels: a collaborator, a, a, a um a free agent, uh, what's it called, light agent. Um, and, and so I encourage everyone that I consult with to use custom roles and use them well. So for example, maybe you have an administrator role um, that is limited in what they can actually administer. Maybe they can't create new brands, but they can create workflows within their own brand. Or or uh, maybe you have uh, leadership, you know, support leaders that that need to access you know, the full reporting and need to be able to add users to their team, but they don't need access to triggers. They don't need to be a full admin. They, they shouldn't be touching those things. So I'm, I'm a big believer in, in making sure your permission sets are, are really locked down using custom roles um, because uh, that also allows you to have tighter change management in the sense that, you know, there's only a small number of people who are allowed to touch certain areas of the product and so if, if you get a request to change a certain area of the product, there's like a handful of people, two, three people that need to talk about that change, knew, know how to contact who might be uh, who might be impacted by that change and can make sure that change is done in a much more uh, considerate, considerate way. Oh, yeah, thanks, Greg. I guess... Um... You know, obviously custom roles would definitely help, but uh, I was taking a look at the, some of the poll results and it seems like about a third of us have more than five people um, that have uh, colleagues with with admin access. So um, one of the first things that we can do in Salto is is, is to give you more visibility into users that, that are making that ch those changes. So I want to kind of walk through some of the functionality in Salto that would allow you to get more visibility into users making those changes. And I did want to mention, um, I saw in the chat here, Alan had a, um, or Alan had actually, uh, Alan O'Connor mentioned that our trigger descriptions are updated by us as a change log every time we include, every time we update yeah. it, including a link to JIRA where the request to the change was initiated. I think that's a great way to get some documentation right there. And you can see, you know, when was it updated? What was it related to? Do you, uh, I'm wondering, Craig, what are some other ways that you've seen users kind of documenting those changes over time? Yeah, so gold star on that one, right? That is that is the best case scenario where you can put in a link yeah, to a JIRA object that says, this is who requested it, why it was requested, when it was approved, who made the change, dates, all that stuff. I, I love that type of audit, audit ability. Um, for me, it's a, it's a tough question because I think it's very use case based. You know, Zendesk, even let's take something simple, a little bit simpler, like a report. It's not going to damage anything. You know, reports aren't going to break Zendesk. But Zendesk reporting is is complicated. You know, if you build a report based on created date versus updated date versus closed date, 
the results could be different and therefore the conclusions could be different uh you know based on what what's being presented to to the various leaders and so let's something simple like that you know you get a request from leaders saying you know I, I i need this report or the leader tries to do it themselves and they you end up with um a wasted effort because multiple people typically go in and just start creating all sorts of different reports and dashboards for their own purposes but you also in, uh, end up with a not apples to apples comparison because someone might be building it under one assumption, someone under another assumption. And so this is where consolidation of, 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 of roles is really important in the sense that who owns the reporting capabilities of Zendesk? So that's a really simple one because there's very little impact. There's probably wasted time, but there's little impact. Now apply that to other areas, right? A great one that I see all the time, uh, a big one that I see all the time is macros. So there's a set of macros that, that have been created by one or more people, they get outdated. And instead of having someone that owns macros and, and goes in and updates them as the product evolves or the services evolve, what I see so many times when I'm shadowing support teams is all the support agents have a Google doc or a, 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 or a notepad, a doc text file. That sounds very familiar. They, they create their own macros. And now all of a sudden the advantage of having a macro, which is quick, easy, automated, is completely wiped out because they're having to switch screens, find it, copy and paste it and send it back in. And so that's the type of thing that I think is a best practice is, is always figuring out who owns these certain areas of the product. And that doesn't mean they have to be the only person that makes the changes there, but there's an owner who has a, a responsibility to ensure that that area of the system is operating well at, at, at any given time and if there is a change management request, such as the the, the uh, Allen's example, that um, that that person can review it and and really understand it and be uh, accountable to making that change. So anything anything that really <clears throat> provide and I and I I want to be very clear. I I'm not a process heavy person. I, I I don't want everything to be about process. But I, I want people to understand that ownership and accountability is important here because, you know, your example of having five admins, five admins can get out of sync pretty easy, especially if they're working in different time zones and they're not even awake at the same time. There can be miscommunication, you know, who owns this? Oh, I didn't do that. I'm sorry. I missed that, that requirement. All those types of things happens all the time. So I would, I would just say assign ownership and accountability to each section as it makes sense. Great, I, I wanted to follow up on the uh, kind of idea that you could use like a ticket as a change request and kind of track uh, changes being made through through that ticket. So uh, just a, a quick example here, I've got a, a ticket in Jira that's, that's, you know, let's say that we had a request come in saying that I, you know, please update this macro. Uh, in Salta, what you could do is you could associate that ticket with a deployment by just uh, simply leveraging the ticket ID. And then later on, the ticket in, within JIRA would be associated with that, uh, the ultimately the commit that was made, which would then get tied back to the Salta deployment. So this is a great way to have some automated documentation. Every single deployment that's done in Salto is gonna, that's related to this ticket within automatically this ticket, update this ticket with any changes uh, that, are, that are being made. There, there's a couple other ways that you can be notified of changes being made uh, directly in production um, by, by any of your admins. So if I jump over to the settings tab in Salto, um, there's a monitor changes. This is where you can set up monitors to notify whenever particular uh, parts of the platform are notified. Now, this is something you could set up to say, you know, if any change is made in, in production, send me an email. You can also be a lot more uh, targeted. So for example, I've set up this specific monitor that says anytime that a trigger is removed, so not if it's added or modified, but specifically if it's removed and if it's removed in Zendesk directly, so not part of a Salto deployment, send me an email. Now I can also send this to a Slack channel, a Teams channel, multiple emails. And because I actually just removed a trigger, let me show you what that would look like. You're, you would get a notification saying that this particular trigger was removed and it would show you a very detailed representation of what was removed. Now, if you were also monitoring on modifications, you could see a side-by-side -side of what was modified. This is a, this is a really great way to, um, be, to be aware of all those changes happening uh, directly in production. Uh, 
The other is that if I come back to the compare and deploy, with in Salto, when you're running deployments through Salto, you're going to automatically get those changes documented. So there's uh, there's no spreadsheet to update. There's no uh, document to update. I can just go into a past deployment. I can see exactly uh, who made that change, and I can go into the exact changes that were made. Uh, this can be really helpful if you're trying to go back in time, kind of investigate, you know, what what happened to particular macros over time. You can see specific changes that were made. Now, on top of that, um, Salto will also pull in all the changes that are happening directly in the Zendesk environment, so happening outside of a Salto deployment, and allow you to continue to document those. So, for example, if I click on this preview push button, this is showing me, basically, it's telling me all of the changes that Salto has detected that are not coming from a Salto deployment. And let's, it looks like someone removed this automation. Now, let's say that this was part of uh, a hot fix or or something like that. I could also say, you know, related to hot fix, uh, you know, and, and give it a particular ID number. So one, two, three, four. I could push those up, and under ver under this version control control tab, it's going to show me a full history of all those changes. Now, just wanted to. Uh, got a couple other questions here in the Q and A. Um, let me jump to those. So another question. Uh, Brock, you'd ask, how, how would you mimic Salto features out there in the wild? Um, seems quite complex, pulling all the data, converting it, and spotting the changes between commits. So uh, the, the way that we're able to do that in Salto is we are running, we basically are, are running calls to the API to uh, check for recent changes, converting that into a flat file structure that we call knuckle files. And that is what we're using to represent the environment. Now, we're also doing some complex mapping of the IDs and, for example, the IDs of fields or, um, or other things like that across environments that allows us to do these deployments without needing for, for you to come in and manually update any internal IDs. So, for example, let's say that, um, like in the, in the macro that I, that I had just created where I updated it to use a new ticket field, and I would also have to deploy that ticket field. Salto will first create the ticket field, get the ID of that, and then adjust the trigger to use the ID of that ticket field. Now, this is all things that Salto will handle on your behalf, so you don't need to, to manually update any of that. And actually, that brings into another question we got from Ashwin about specifically about the Salto IDs. Um, when an object name is changed in Sandbox uh, and another admin goes to regenerate those Salto IDs, how can, how can we work on that? So Ashwin, if you don't mind, we're going to follow up with you directly because um, we'd like to get a little bit more context and make sure that we can uh, address that that specific use case. Now, let me jump to our next topic um, because, Craig, you just kind of talked a little bit about that. So ad lots of admins making changes. Now, yeah. not only getting visibility to those changes, but what if they're bad changes? What if they're changes you need to revert? Yeah, it's... um. I think this stems a lot from the the thought of oh I know what I you know I know what I'm doing this is just a small change it, it stems from that kind of like idea that a small change could have is not going to have a big impact which which I think is is wrong in many complex Zendesk uh, uh, instances um, you know you come in uh, something something as small as adding the wrong uh, the all versus any I think I used that example earlier. Putting putting the the field the the rule in the all versus any can drastically change the definition of the trigger. It can either stop it from working altogether, or it can run too frequently, depending on what you're you're attempting to do. And so, what I see here is um, it, the problem isn't so much the change itself; it's the troubleshooting of how to figure out what that, that what happened. Because especially when a trigger is not firing. You need to, if you haven't got a documenta documentation, you'd have to go find an example of where it did fire, figure out what trigger it is, go to it, and then, as I said, depending on the what object it is, whether it's an automation or trigger, uh, you you have to then go and troubleshoot, well, what changed? What happened? I had a use case. This was a, a company I was consulting with back in January where um, nothing seemed wrong. And then I was doing some auditing of, of some tickets, and I was like, 
I noticed that email notifications for the initial response to the ticket were not getting sent. So basically a, a customer was writing an email in, the agent was responding, but that email was never sent. The email trigger had been disabled by someone. But they didn't notice that because they had an automation that two days later would follow up with the customer if there was no response on the ticket. And since there was no, they didn't know the, the agent had responded to them, there was a, never a response. So two days would go by, this automation would run, and then the customer would write back and say, no, this is still an issue, or no, I solved it all myself. And so to the, the team, the tickets were getting solved, everything seemed to be fine. And it took them, this is true, three months to notice that their initial response email trigger was not executing. And every single one of those tickets, the customer was getting a very bad experience mm -hmm. uh, because obviously they weren't getting a response for, for over two days. But they didn't notice because nothing seemed wrong because after the first response, the triggers were firing fine. And, and they, of course, no one knows who uh, disabled that that trigger. It's been going on for three months. It's probably you know impossible to tell why they did it because there was no documentation of why they would disable it. That's a big bad change. I mean, it, it wasn't just a dream. It's, it was true. Um, and so these are things that uh, something that seems small can have these massive impacts uh, to just customer experience to the system itself, uh, to, to other a administrators. Uh, and, and it's something you need to think about, right? It's something you need to worry about because uh, this company was smaller. They had a very small set of, of clients, low, lower volume, but you do that at a multinational company with uh, thousands of tickets a day, you're going to get some angry customers and some angry CSAT re reviews. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's even just noticing that that change impacted you. But once you notice that, that, sh that, you know, something isn't acting as expected, you need to go into the investigation and how would you uh, resolve that? W what about that process? How, how can you do that? How are you able to actually find yeah. that change that you need to revert? Well, I'll, I'll use this example I just gave as the, as the perfect one. So th in this case, a trigger wasn't firing. So I, I was uh, in my head, I said, okay, well, it's an email trigger. So I need to go and search uh, for a trigger that, that has an email clause in it. And this is a little known feature. Some people don't, don't know this, but in the searching for trigger uh, window in the, in, the, in the triggers interface, you can actually search for rule types. It's a rarely used feature. I find a lot of administrators don't know it's the case, but you can go and say, I want to search for these rule types. There's a drop down. Most people just search for the text. That, that's the way of searching and that's the default. But drop that field down, and you can do some much more targeted searches. So that's that's a that's a, a tip. I hope uh, hope people look into. So I searched for in this case for email triggers, and there was you know, maybe uh, half a dozen of them. So luckily in this case it was a very small implementation. And then it was just a matter of going through each one and figuring well what trigger should have been the one that was sending this email. And luckily in this case it was fairly quick. It took probably a, maybe an hour to figure out okay this one that's disabled is the one that we want. And then we have to, before we enable it, to my point from earlier where reverting this stuff can have the opposite effect and break something else, you know, then we had to validate, is the rule correct? Uh, will this send emails at the wrong time? And this is where Sandbox comes in. And I think this is the part you're going to touch on. But if I enable that trigger, especially something customer facing like an email, it's instantaneous in production. So while I'm testing it, something could happen. So a way around that, um, a, a trick I use is I put an added clause in the trigger, such as the edit has to have been made by Craig Stoss, right? Or something like that, where I can test it, but to the rest of the world, it still appears disabled. That's not an ideal solution. And again, this is where Salto comes in, but it's something that you as an administrator can do to, to limit the scope of and potential impact of, of making changes in, in production. So, yeah, that, uh, and, and just, great tip. sorry, just to do one, one more generic things, but so when you're troubleshooting these things, especially things where something is not happening, when something is happening, use the events on the ticket to find out what is happening. And you can usually go through and click. Luckily Zendesk does allow you to click through from the events page into the direct objects that are being executed. Um, so that's usually the, the first step. Um, but when something's not happening, 
you really have to start with uh, what am I actually looking for? You know, like, is it an automation that's not happening? Is it a trigger that's not happening? Um, is it a field that uh, a value is being missed somehow? Start with what object is is the impacted object because that that will at least limit your scope of what you need to research. Yeah, those, those are all great tips. Um, let me jump right into uh, kind of how Salta would help you identify the change that was made that broke things as well as uh, get you back into working order quickly. And while I jump that, uh, I noticed, got another question here. Um, uh, trying to use chatbots in our help center, but we're wary of letting it run wild in production. So uh, wanting to kind of test out the chatbot in, in help center, but not wanting to necessarily turn it on in, in production. So what are, the, what are some options there? Um, can Salto work for guide too? So, so yes, yeah, so Salto also works for a uh, guide in terms of the articles. Salto can help fetch and deploy articles between your sandbox and production environment. So let's say that you wanted to test out your chatbot, but test it out in sandbox first. You could use Salto to take all of your articles from your help articles from production, push them to your sandbox help instance, and uh, and then run your chatbot there safely without impacting uh, customers in production. Now, let me jump right into how you could restore a change. So remember I had that monitor where I noticed that that trigger was removed in production. So let's say this one is called uh, assign account manager to high priority tickets. This is probably one that we need to get back ASAP. Uh, we've got a lot of high priority customers um, opening tickets, need to make sure that the right people are, are getting assigned to them. Now in Salto, what I can do is actually uh, just completely restore that to production. Um, remember earlier I mentioned that Salto runs a fetch to pull down the configuration metadata. Now these fetches can be ran on a schedule, hourly, daily, weekly, and as well as they can be ran manually at any time. And those fetches form the foundation of a snapshot that can be used to restore back to at any time. So if I come back uh, into Salto and go into the compare and deploy section, one of the options for, de uh, for deployment is restore to a previous version. This is going to show you all of the previous snapshots that Salto has taken as part of that, that fetch, and then allow you to uh, select specific, I'm in the wrong environment. I need to restore that in production, not sandbox. So let me go uh, jump into my production environment and here we go. And it's going to show me all the scheduled fetches that have been running for this environment. And I know that it, when I took, let's see, I got this at uh, about three hours ago. So I know that at least at 9.03 AM, I had this, uh, I had this trigger in production. So I can go ahead and create a restore deployment and it will show me that trigger as well as all my other changes that have happened since uh, since this time this morning. Now, you could of course restore everything that uh, back to this previous state, but in this case, really what I wanna do here is restore that trigger. This is the only chain, maybe there's a lot of different changes that took place, but I just wanna restore this one change so I can move forward and get this uh, deployed right back into production, get me into working order. Now, uh, the, the great thing about this is that if I were to do this uh, restore, this type of deployment would be documented. So I not only am, am I documenting all the changes, kind of known changes that are happening from moving a change from, from sandbox to production, but I'm also documenting any sort of revert or restore type of uh, deployment that's happening. So I get a full history, full context into all the changes that are happening to production. So I've got a couple other questions in the Q&A. And first question comes from DJ asking around, how do we uh, accommodate instance specific configurations when deploying from sandbox to production with Salto? So example, uh, Zendesk support addresses had different domains between sandbox and production. So rules using a received mm -hmm. at, at condition may be listed as different between these two instances because they're two different emails. So that's, that's a great question, DJ. So at a, let me just kind of walk you through what what a specific uh, support email might look like with, with Salto. So if I take a look at all of my brands that I've got, these are different subdomains. They've each got a specific uh, uh, subdomain as well as a oh, uh, support address, uh, the support address, that's what I was looking for. Um, this is a specific support address. So Salto 
at, at a really high level, Salto is going to store the reference to that support address if it's taking place in a trigger condition or an action, not, not the actual email address. So that way, as you're deploying it, Salto will then update the reference if it's if it's to production. Um, DJ, we will also follow up with you after, after the call because uh, I want to give you a little bit more information and just make sure that that kind of fully answers uh, the question for you. And then a question from Brock, how long does Salto hold the snapshots? That is a great question. So if you come back into Salto, if I do restore to previous version, so for now, uh, essentially, as soon as you run that first fetch with Salto, it's instantly going to make a, a snapshot. So that's a, a great kind of first first thing you can do with Salto. As soon as you run that first fetch, you have a snapshot to restore back to at any time. Uh, now, for the time being, we're, we we are kind of keeping them. Uh, there's no no limit that might change in the future, but for the time being, we uh, kind of uh, no no kind of end. And, uh, and for those, as well as we do store them at the full granularity of whatever sort of um, uh, whatever sort of fetch schedule that you're on hourly, daily or, or weekly. And oh, oh, sorry, Brock, I saw you had another question there. So how, how would you move the snapshots elsewhere for long term storage? That, that's actually a, a great question. So these snapshots are, are something that Salto is holding specifically for that restore capability. But for more kind of documentation purposes, as well as to get that full history, that full change log of all the changes that are happening to your instance, that's something that Salto can do by hooking up to a Git repository. So if you're familiar with Git, it's a version control system typically used for software developers to track changes happening in their applications and in the code base. Because, as I mentioned, Salto is transforming all the configuration metadata into a flat file structure, we can essentially treat that as code and commit them up to Git. And so what Salto will do is it um, we can help you create a branch in your Git repository. And this is in your uh, Git organization, whether you're in GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Azure DevOps, or any, any really any Git provider. And as you're making deployments to Salto, it will update automatically with those changes happening um, uh, in Git. Now, let me, sh let me show you, for example, I've got a, uh, deployment over here. So again, Salto is going to show you kind of the uh, code level representation of those changes. This is a Git repository that would be owned on, on your side. So um, you would ha will always have access to all those changes. And again, this is compatible with GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. I'm just showing Git, GitHub as an example here. All right, so that completes our kind of three three main challenges just to, to run through again. Um, you know, how, how what are some of the challenges of aligning sandbox and production? Can it be done? You know, what happens when, you know, someone touches your trigger, how to, how to effectively collaborate with the other admins in your Zendesk environment? And then how do you actually revert a change if, if it's bad, you know, customers aren't receiving their, their, their updates to their tickets? If anyone has any more questions, we still got still got about nine minutes left on the webinar. Happy to stay here. And actually, I already got a question. So what's the best Git crash course? I don't have any formal experience with the platform. It seems like a good thing to learn. That's a great question. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure about the best crash course for Git itself, but yeah. I will let you know. I don't, Craig, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, no, I, I, I don't know either. I mean, the, the good news is because of the nature of Git, the open source nature and the, and the widespread use of it, um, there, there's tons of courses on it, but I, I couldn't tell you where, where to go for the, the best one or the, the most succinct one. So, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take a look, Brock. I'll, I'll try to follow up with you directly about this one. Um, however, I, I did want to let you know that in terms of like how Salto integrates with Git, beyond the initial Git integration, which is a, a pretty simple, just connecting and authenticating to the repo, Salto runs all of those actions for you. So, um, so, so for example, there's a, there's a command called commit, which creates like a message that shows all your changes. Salto is going to automatically do that. And in fact, if I go to the settings here under version control, you can, you can select, you know, 
with each deployment push the changes made to each branch. So even if you don't uh, not intimately familiar with how Git works, it doesn't uh, it won't block you from being able to leverage uh, Git with Salto. And then one more question uh, from Ashwin. Following your question, following your answer, uh, do you have on your roadmap variations of other objects like org IDs, webhooks? Uh, Ashwin, if you don't mind, I'm going to follow up with you directly just to make sure that we get the full context and uh, we, we can provide you a little bit more uh, insight. Yeah, so, so uh, in, in a way, I guess you can think of Salto as a, as a great introduction to Git uh, uh, if, you, if you've never used it before, because it's going to automatically be pushing these changes up to a Git repository. You can kind of see the impact of changes over time. Um, it, it does not require uh, uh, any sort of expert level uh, to be able to use Salto. That being said, if you do know Git, there's some... There's a lot of additional functionality you can kind of get from Salto uh, because of the fact that we're turning all of those configurations into code. But it's it's certainly not a, everything that I did today that I showed you. You do not need to know how to use Git to be able to leverage that in your own Salto account. And uh, so for anyone that's still on, Lior has put a couple couple links in the chat here uh, specifically about our backup and restore capabilities. There's a blog post that talks a little bit more about our use cases, how to get started with that feature. Um, also, you can sign up for a free trial with Salto and get a feel of how it would look for your environment. We already put a link to our signup page there, as well as uh, if you'd like to meet with our team and get a little bit more of a customized deep dive demo, uh, there's a sign up link there. And in any other questions, feel free to drop them in chat. And thank you all for attending. It was really great to have everyone on the line. Hopefully you learned some. Some Craig was sharing some great tips. So hopefully you don't need this and hopefully everything in production always goes smoothly but just in case hopefully we've given just you a case. few tips to, <laughs> to make things a little bit easier yeah absolutely good luck everyone